everybody's back. Of course you are. Where the marker spaces. And we're also going to talk about type and cotype, which can be conveniently written as cotype with co in brackets like that. This whole concept of the rata market space is it's becoming standard. Like not everybody uses this notation or this concept. Like you don't formally need this concept, but I think it's kind of enlightening to think of these as Barnack spaces in their own right. And, you know, I'm teaching the course so I can use all my own preferences here. So I'm going to teach them as, you know, in this way as spaces. So what do we have? We have a Barnack space as we always do. And we're going to say for a natural number n, we define the Rademacher space, or in this case, the finite Rademacher space. Which we call epsilon sub n of x. To be the set of finite sequences. Uh, x bullet, so this is xn from n from zero to n. You might want to go from n equals one to n if you like. It depends on how you like to count. I like to start at zero. So these are sequences in x and you take the following norm. You can guess what the norm is. There are a couple of choices you can take. You take the Rademacher right average, of course. And you can decide, do I want to do this? Which LP do I want to make this definition in? Because by Khan Kinchin, it doesn't matter. They're all equivalent. There are two natural choices to make. One is L1, one is L2. All of the other Ps are not very natural. For the purposes of this definition, I'm going to take L2. There's a reason this is more natural. It'll come up later on. So LP is also possible. You get equivalent norms independently of n if you take a different p. So this Rademacher space is a is a sequence space, an x-valued sequence space. But you make a clever choice of norm. You don't take something like L two or LP. You take the Rademacher average, because that's a more natural thing to take. And we also define the infinite Rademacher space, which is more useful. We just call it epsilon of x. It's the set of sequences, like okay, a fully infinite sequences now. Sequences over the natural numbers valued in x. And we can't just write down this norm. We have to say it's a space of infinite sequences such that the Rademacher sum exists let's say, such that this Rademacher sum converges in L2, because it might not converge. <laughs> if it doesn't converge, then we don't have a sense of what this is. Set of sequences such that we have that convergence in L2 with the obvious choice of norm. You take this infinite Rademacher average in L2. Now, of course, by Kahan Kinchin, if it converges in L, it converges in L2 if and only if it converges in LP. This convergence doesn't care what P you take. And you can take the LP norm instead of the L2 norm if you like, and that's going to be an equivalent norm. So any of these choices will do, but for reasons, I'll take two. I think in my papers, I'd take one as the definition, but it is more natural to take two. My papers are stupid. What do I want to do right here? And I should add that epsilon is an arbitrary Rademacher sequence. You know now that it doesn't matter which Rademacher sequence you take. Everything only depends on the distributions and they all have the same distribution. So you have the freedom to change your Rademacher sequence depending on the context. You know, we've seen, we saw an argument just before where you changed that. Yeah. So what's the point of this Rademacher space? 
Why do we define it? In short, the Rademacher space based on X or the Rademacher space valued in X, whatever you want to call it. It's an analog of the sequence space L2 valued in X. You can define the sequence space L2 valued in X. That's not a problem. It's a perfectly good space. Um, I think I was mentioning this a couple of lectures ago. For a lot of applications, it's not suitable. You can define it, but it has bad properties. This Rademacher space epsilon X behaves a lot like L2. I guess what I should say is it behaves a lot like L2 should. L2X doesn't behave that well most of the time, whereas the Rademacher space epsilon X behaves better. And what Kinchin's inequality tells you, not Kahan Kinchin, but just straight Kinchin. Kinchin's inequality implies that the Rademacher space based on a Hilbert space is actually L2. So remember we have this Kinchin inequality that says a Rademacher sum in a Hilbert space is the L2 sum. You don't need the Rademacher variables. So our intuition says that Hilbert spaces behave well when you do vector valued analysis and that general Banach spaces do not. One of the manifestations of that is that you don't need the Rademacher space in the case of a Hilbert space. You can just work with the sequence space L2. All right, let's make another definition. So if I've, okay, I haven't really convinced you that the Rademacher spaces are interesting or important, but taking for granted that they are, that we're gonna to have to work with them. The natural question to ask is, can I compare Rademacher spaces with, with other natural sequence spaces? Maybe not L2, but what about LP for other values of P? Can we at least get some containments with something we know and understand? And sometimes we can, not always. We have to make that into a definition. It becomes a Banach space property. Let's take P between one and two and Q between two and infinity, both including endpoints. We say that X, which is a Banach space, of course, has type P or in full Rademacher type P. If we have the following estimate, if the Rademacher norm of the sequence X, so the Rademacher average of the sequence within L2, doesn't matter. If this norm is controlled by the LP norm of the sequence, of course I could have just written that out as X bullet LPX. If we have this for all sequences X in LP, this is type P. I haven't said anything about Q yet. So X has type P if the Rademacher norm is controlled by the LP norm. And X has Rademacher, sorry, not type, Rademacher cotype Q if the reverse estimate holds in LQ. So if the LQ norm of a sequence is controlled by the Rademacher norm, this is for all X in the Rademacher space. Okay, these last conditions are kind of redundant. I mean, in this first one, if X is not in LP, then the right-hand side is infinity and the estimate is true, <laughs> right? This estimate only really makes sense for sequences that are in LP or sequences that are in the Rademacher space in this case. Now we can write things a little bit more abstractly in terms of function space or sequence space inclusions. I think that's a more natural way to write it. Type P says that LP is continuously contained in the Rademacher space. And cotype Q says that the Rademacher space is continuously contained in LQ. Got that? If we formulate these things, oh, we can formulate these. I can formulate these in terms of the finite Rademacher spaces. 
and finite sequence spaces. So type P says that your, your finite sequence space LP. So this is the LP norm on sequences from zero to N. So N plus one element sequences. This finite LP space needs to be contained in the finite Rademacher space uniformly in N. You actually always have this containment for, for finite N, but the norms can blow up as N approaches infinity. The norm of the inclusion map. You need this inclusion map to be uniformly bounded in N. The same is true for cotype. I haven't been very explicit about it, but you can always approximate. Okay, if you have an infinite Rademacher sum, you're postulating that the series converges. And so you can write the series as the limit of finite Rademacher sums. So you can always write the infinite Rademacher norm as the, the limit or the supremum of the, the finite Rademacher norms in N as N approaches infinity. So if you ever want to prove something about infinite Rademacher sums or Rademacher averages or Rademacher spaces, you just prove it for the finite ones uniformly in N and that will do. There's some exercises to this effect. You should look at them. So let's type in cotype. These are fairly simple definitions. These turn out to be very profound Barnack space properties when you look at them deeply enough. That's why they're definitions. So what can we say about spaces with type P or cotype Q? When can we establish it? How can we establish type P for some P or cotype Q for some Q? Generally, you have to actually use the structure of the Barnack space to prove this property because okay, I've defined it as a property, so I should follow that not all Barnack spaces have it, right? Of course, that's the case. I'll give an example. Uh, every X has type one and cotype infinity. These are the trivial types and cotypes. So for type one, what you do is you look at the, let's look at infinite spaces, of course. You look at the Rademacher average in L2. This is the Rademacher norm of a sequence. And to show that X is type one, we need to show that this is controlled by the L1 norm of the sequence. So we just use a triangle inequality. And in this L2 norm, we see that this, this Rademacher variable epsilon n has got value plus or minus one. It's not gonna contribute to the L2 norm at all. So we can ignore it. And we just get a constant well, maybe I'll write that explicitly just to be really clear what's happening with that L2 norm. Because I know this can be confusing if you've seen it for the first time. So this Rademacher variable epsilon n omega doesn't alter the norm of the vector. And now you have an integral over a probability space of a function that doesn't depend on the probability variable at all. So you just get xn squared to the one half. So the powers drop out and you get the probability of omega, which is of course one. So that can be ignored, right? And this is the L1 norm of the sequence. So every Barnack space has type one. And when you talk about type P or type one, you have a, a less squiggle here. You're allowed to have a constant. That constant can't depend on anything, but you're allowed to have a constant. In this case, the constant's one. Every Barnack space has type one with constant one. It's the best you can possibly do. As for cotype infinity, you need to show that the supremum over N of the norm of XN is controlled by you know, less than or equal to constant times the Rademacher average in L2. This would be cotype infinity. The contraction principle, 
says, okay, let's take our xn. Let's fix an n. We look at the norm of xn. This is actually the norm of a, a Radomacher sum where you take as your coefficients the, the delta function. So delta, let's write this m, delta nm xm. Because all of the terms are going to vanish except for the term m equals n. And then as before, you're going to have this L2 number with a single writer marker variable instead of a sum. And then you can pull that out because it's not going to affect the value of the norm. So the contraction principle, these are all real valued and they're all between minus one and one. So the contraction principle tells you that with constant one, this is less than the Rademacher sum, the Rademacher average, sorry, without coefficients. You don't need the constant of two or pi on two or whatever, because the, the coefficients here are real valued and they're between minus one and one. So we get it with constant one. So this tells you every Barnack space has cotype infinity with constant one, just as every Barnack space has type one with constant one. So, okay, this is always true. So we always have continuous inclusions. L1 of X is contained in the Rademacher space epsilon of X, and that's contained in L infinity X. So this sequence space that we defined is at least sandwiched between two sequence spaces we know about. It's not too unnatural. It's contained in L infinity, it contains L1. This is good to know. Of course, in general, we have L1 is contained in LP. This is for P greater than one. That's contained in LQ for Q greater than P, Q less than infinity. That's contained in L infinity. You have these containments of sequence spaces. As P increases, the sequence space increases. So the properties of type P and cotype Q is really about how closely can you sandwich this Rademacher space between two of these sequence spaces in this scale. So you have L1, L infinity, and epsilon somewhere in between, and you want to find the best P and Q such that you can get it in between LP and LQ. Of course, it's gonna follow that P has to be less than Q or equal to Q, because you don't have the reverse inclusions here. <laughs> Hey, Alex, yep. uh, are, are there some special conditions on being able to embed? Well, there are some special conditions for embedding LP into other uh, LQ spaces, right? Like, you, do they, these need to have be like finite measure or something? Yeah, I'm sort of implicitly writing everywhere here L1 of the natural numbers with counting. Yeah, okay, so it's just sort of the natural numbers. It's right? just using the fact that it's, it's counting measure, it's atomic. Yeah, it's counting it, yeah. Yeah. That's what gives you this inclusion. If it had finite measure, you'd have the reverse containments. Yeah, it'd be the opposite. But the natural right. numbers obviously don't have finite measure when you put the counting measure on them. So yeah, okay, we just have, okay. yeah. The easiest way to remember this is L1 is contained in L infinity because if you have a sequence that's some yeah. of it, then obviously, none, obviously it can't blow up. <laughs> Otherwise it wouldn't be summable. And the argument can be generalized to general P and Q. I mean, one's less than infinity, so if P is less than Q, then LP is contained in LQ. We can... That's not a proof. Yeah. No. no assumptions on X, of course. Everything's just using the norm. Yeah. Okay, so their example shows that every Barnack space has type one, cotype infinity. So this leads us to a bit of terminology. It's important. Say that X has non-trivial type. If it has type P for some P greater than one and say that it has finite cotype if it has cotype Q for some Q less than infinity. That's a bit badly formatted, but you can read that. The thing with this definition of type and cotype just going back to the definition, 
there's nothing stopping you from having more than one different type and cotype, right? It's not like you have type P and only type P. I mean, every Barnack space is type one and cotype infinity, but it may also have type two and cotype two. It may have type some other type P and some other cotype Q. You, it's not restricting you to just one. There's a whole set of P's and Q's for which you have type P and cotype Q in general. In particular, just coming from sequence space inclusions, type P implies type P tilde for all P tilde between one and P. So if you have a certain type, you have all lower types because if LP is contained in epsilon X, you know that LP tilde is contained in LP, right? So in particular, LP tilde is contained in epsilon X. So this says that if you've got type P, you've also got all lower types down to one. The same is true for cotype. Cotype Q implies cotype Q tilde for all Q tilde between Q and infinity. So type decreases for free and cotype increases for free. That makes sense because type one and cotype infinity are the trivial ones. So it's about how high can you get the type and how low can you get the cotype? Yeah. Um, obviously type P and cotype Q implies that P is less than or equal to Q because <laughs> you're gonna have LPX contained in LQX. And you don't have this containment unless Q is greater than or equal to P. But actually you can say something a bit better. Type P implies P is less than or equal to two. And cotype Q implies that Q is greater than or equal to two. So actually this situation that P and Q overlap is never gonna happen because type has to be less than two and cotype has to be greater than, well, both less than or equal to two, greater than or equal to two. Um, I actually, impose that in the definition <laughs> without saying anything. I said P has, like, what's stopping you from taking P greater than two? What's stopping you is the fact that the scalar field doesn't have type P for P greater than two or cotype Q for Q greater than two. This is because of Kinchin's inequality. Yeah, Calvin says in the chat, this is part of the definition. Yeah, it was part of the definition, but I didn't have to make it part of the definition. And if I didn't make it part of the definition, it would follow. Let me just give a very short argument for why this is the case. Case with the scalar field K. By Kinshin's inequality. Yeah. The Radomacher space of the scalar field is L2. And you cannot have LP contained in L2 for P greater than 2. All right. So for the one dimensional case, for the case of the scalar field, these restrictions on type and cotype are necessary. And if you've got a Banach space and it's got type P, then every subspace is also going to have type P. And in particular, the scalar field is going to have type P because <laughs> the scalar field can be seen very easily as a one dimensional subspace for the Banach space. So if a Banach space X has type P, then the scalar field has type P, which implies that P is less than or equal to two. So this restriction is necessary. So this property here is a bit pointless. I've got this. That was a bit messy, I'm sorry, but I hope that made sense. Let me give another example where we can compute things explicitly. Take a measure space. And let's take our Barnack space to be LP over this measure space. And let's take P less than infinity because funny things happen at infinity. Then I'll first claim X has type, what would you guess the type would be? You'd guess it would be P, but P could be greater than two. <laughs> it has type min P2. And it has cotype 
max p2. So it's got type and cotype p, but with a restriction that p has to be less than two or greater than two, depending on whether you've taken the type or cotype. Let's prove that x has type p when p is less than or equal to two, because otherwise it gets a little bit fiddly. I mean, all of the proofs are the same. Let's just show that when, when p is less than or equal to two, then x has type two. We fix the sequence fn in the space. I mean, I like to think of abstract Banach spaces, but here we're really thinking of an LP space. So the sequence is a sequence of, of functions, but these functions are vectors in a Banach space, right? We need to look at this Rademacher average. This is an L2 of omega valued in X and X is LPS, yep. So remember we had the, this consequence of Kinchin Kahan that Rademacher sums or Rademacher averages in LP spaces are just square functions. So this is the LP norm of the function of this function here. Remember that? Maybe not. You can go back, it's in the notes. Now we're gonna we're taking p less than two here. So this L2 norm on the inside here is less than or equal to the LP norm on the inside. Using these sequence space inclusions, little LP is contained in little L2. So the little L2 norm is controlled by the little LP norm. Is that clear to everybody? Should I write out the explicit pointwise estimate directly? I mean, this is taking an actually a pointwise estimate for all S in the space. The norm on the inside is actually a, a small L2 norm. So we can control that by a small LP norm on the inside. We can write this out explicitly. This is the integral over S sum over N, Fn of S to the P d mu of s to the one on p. There is a, a term here that I didn't write, which is p on p, right? I have an LP norm on the inside and on the outside. I'm gonna do a Fabini trick here. Very common thing to do. So that's your Fabini. Now this is the sum over n of the LP norm of Fn to the p everything to the one on P. And this is the norm of the sequence F in LP valued in, in X, which is LPS. So this says LPS has type P. Remembering, of course, this is for P less than or equal to two. If P is greater than two, you have to use Minkowski's inequality in this Fabini argument, but you can do it, it works. Right, so what else can we say about LP other than that it's got type min P2, cotype max P2? Does it have any better type or cotype? We haven't ruled out that it doesn't have larger type or smaller cotype. It, it doesn't, but we haven't ruled it out. I should say if S is such that LPS is finite dimensional, which can happen if S is finite, like has finitely many points or whatever. Then we know that LP of S is actually isomorphic to L2 of S because it's a finite dimensional space and any two norms in a finite dimensional space are equivalent. And then it has type two and cotype two, which is the best possible. And it's a Hilbert space. It's isomorphic to a Hilbert space, which is already the best possible thing. But that's assuming finite dimensionality. Every finite dimensional space has type two and cotype two because it's isomorphic to a Hilbert space. But anyway, if your LP space is infinite dimensional, which is usually the case, then you have type min P2, 
cotype max P2, and this is optimal. By that, I mean you don't have any larger type or any smaller cotype. That's an exercise in the notes somewhere. It's actually not too hard to show where it did I, which exercise is it? I didn't write down the number. It's an exercise in the notes. So you can't do better than that. But this is all for P between one and infinity, not including infinity, because as I said very quickly, weird things happen at infinity. Before I talk about P equals infinity, just note here, you've got time to min P2 and cotype max P2. One of these is two, right? P is less than two. If P is less than two, then you have cotype two. If P is greater than two, then you have type two. So in the case of LP spaces, you always have either optimal type or optimal cotype because two is the best possible type and the best possible cotype. The LP, LP spaces are kind of special in that one of the type and cotype is always the best possible. This doesn't have to be the case. Not every Barnack space has that property. LP is special. So what happens at P equals infinity? Let's not look at L infinity directly. Let's look at everybody's favorite bad space. C0. C0 is awful. C0 has no finite cotype and no non-trivial type. C0 has nothing that every Barnack space doesn't already have with regard to type and cotype. We'll show that it doesn't have finite cotype. The proof that it doesn't have non-trivial types is a bit harder. It's an exercise, but it's, it's guided. I've given all of the steps in the exercise so you can do it. It's sort of surprising that proof. So it's proved that it's got no finite cotype. Let's consider the standard basis vectors as we usually do. We write them as EN. Remember, these are the sequences that are one at N and zero everywhere else. C0 is a space of sequences on N that, uh, that converge to zero at infinity using the, the soup norm, L infinity norm. And if we take a, a natural number N and a Q less than infinity, Q is gonna be our hypothetical cotype that we are not gonna have. First, let's look at the Rademacher average, let's go up to n minus one so that I have n terms because I'm starting at zero. Let's look at the Rademacher average of the first n basis vectors. So this is an L2 valued in C0. Let's write out the L2 norm explicitly. Then what we're gonna have on the inside is a vector epsilon zero, omega, epsilon one omega up to epsilon n minus one omega, then a bunch of zeros. We're gonna take the norm of that in C zero and take an L2 norm of this. I'm running out of space. There. Now this vector that we're taking the norm of has plus minus one in all of its entries or zero. And the maximum of the absolute value of these is obviously one here. So we get the integral over omega of one d omega to the one half, which is one. That's our Rademacher average. Now, if we take the LQ norm of the sequence, uh, can we write it out properly? All of these norms on the inside are one. So we have the sum of one to the one on Q and we have N terms here, right? So this is N to the one on Q. And this is for all N that we did this construction. So if C0 had cotype Q, 
then we would have that the LQ norm is controlled by the Rademacher average. Now this is false, right? Okay, what I mean by this squiggle, just to make this more clear, is that there's a constant C such that N to the one on Q is controlled by C, bounded by C for all N. Now this is obviously not true because the left-hand side goes to infinity as N goes to infinity. And the right-hand side obviously doesn't, right? That's a contradiction. So C zero has no finite cotype. It's not so easy to show that it doesn't have non-trivial type. <laughs> The proof is actually quite interesting. The idea of the proof that C0 has no non-trivial type. You show that L1 with n elements, so the n dimensional or n plus one dimensional L1 space actually embeds isometrically into C0 for all n, which is a bit of a miracle. This is not obvious. <laughs> the, the embedding here is not an obvious one. I've written it out in the exercises. Like I'll, I'll tell you what the embedding is and you verify that it's isometric. But C0 is large enough to fit isometric copies of L1. So if C0 has type P, it implies that L1n has type P Okay, it does have type P, it's finite dimensional, but it has to be uniformly in N, right? And that's going to imply that L1 has type P. And you're going to show in another exercise, or you will have already shown that this is a case, this is an LP space with P less than infinity, and we know what the type and cotype properties of that are. L1, infinite dimensional L1 spaces do not have non trivial type. They've got cotype two, but they only have type one. And it turns out by this argument here, C0 can't do any better than L1 can. So C0 doesn't have non-trivial type. It's a nice proof, you should do the exercise, definitely. The reason this is kind of surprising is that you like to think of L infinity as being a kind of limit as P goes to infinity of LP, right? This is how you should think and LP as type two for all P greater than two, less than infinity, let me say, for all P between two and infinity, not including infinity. So as P approaches infinity, LP has got type two, it's got the best possible type, but then at this limit, you suddenly lose it. You don't have any non-trivial type anymore. So type is not continuous under these kinds of heuristic limits. <laughs> this is not a real limit in any way, this is a heuristic limit. In the heuristic topology type is not continuous. <laughs> so that's all a bit strange. So these are the examples I want you to remember. Um, LP, L infinity, C0, whatever. Okay, C0 doesn't have anything non-trivial and it follows that L infinity also doesn't have anything non-trivial because C0 is contained in L infinity. Now, the last bit of notes, going back to the Rademacher spaces, epsilon x, because that's what we were talking about this whole time. I've been saying that these behave like, these are like well-behaved versions of L2, yeah? And if we look at the sequence space L2 valued in x, and we look at it as dual, it's sometimes equal to L2 of x star, right? This is if x star has, or if and only if, I think. Mm. I'll say if, just in case I'm wrong. If X star has the radon Nikodian property. This is what we showed maybe a week or two ago. I can't remember. So this duality for L2 spaces depends on a Barnack space property. And I told you that Rademacher spaces are like more well-behaved versions of L2. So you might expect that the dual of the Rademacher space of X is the Rademacher space of X dual. It's not always true, it turns out. They're not that well behaved. This turns out to be true if X 
has non-trivial type. So you still don't get it for free. Turns out this is a really deep theorem. And there's no way we can prove it in this course, but I might do something at some point where I at least black box some of it and then prove the rest. Actually, I think we will do that. But we can prove something. We can prove a sort of, we can prove a Cauchy-Schwartz type inequality for the Rademacher spaces. And this is gonna be enough a lot of the time. Let's consider a sequence in a Rademacher space and another sequence, but our sequence of elements of the Rademacher space of the dual of X. So we have a sequence in X and a sequence of functionals. Then if you take the sum over all N of the pairing of XN with XN star, so this is the, this is the duality pairing you'd expect to have for sequence spaces. Cauchy Schwartz says this is less than the L2 norm of the first sequence times the L2 norm of the second sequence. What you have is that this is less than or equal to the Rademacher norm, well, the product of the Rademacher norms of these sequences. So this is a Rademacher Cauchy Schwartz, if you want to call it that. I'll prove it. Proof is not too bad. Let's take a Rademacher sequence. On some probability space. Then by the independence, you can do this. You can say that this, this sum of the pairings of the two vectors or the vector root the functional is actually the expectation of the pairing of one Rademacher sum against another Rademacher sum. So now we have sum over N and sum over M, but with the same Rademacher sequence. Why is this true? The reason this is true the right hand side you can expand it out it's the expectation uh what do I the sum over n and m of the expectation of epsilon n epsilon m against the pairing of xn and x star m and you have independence of these Rademacher variables so this term actually vanishes if n is not m and it's equal to one if n is equal to m, because epsilon n squared is one. So all of the off-diagonal terms cancel out. And you get that, the left-hand side. Very quick independence proof of that. So now you can just use the classical Cauchy-Schwartz Say, okay, this is equal to the absolute value, well, let's say less than or equal to the integral over omega of the absolute value of the pairing of these two Rademacher sums. I should write out the variable omega as well, to be clear. Oh, what happened now? There we go. So we have that. This is less than or equal to, by the definition of the, the dual norm, this is the norm in X of the first Rademacher sum times the norm in X star of the second. That's the definition of the dual norm. And now we can just use Cauchy-Schwarz in omega, holders inequality with exponents two and two. 
And this is how we defined our Radomacher norms as L2 averages. And that's it. This is the sole reason that I chose L2 averages in the definition of the Radomacher spaces. Because otherwise we'd have to take this with a constant that comes from the Kahankin gene inequality. <laughs> So here, this is less than or equal to. There's no constant, the constant is one. I could have this with a constant depending on P if I used you know, P to define the Radomacher averages, you know, if I write epsilon suit P or something like that, <laughs> which you can do. This is actually done in the analysis in Barnack Spaces book, but I'm just gonna take two. If I took P equal one, I'd have the same problem. There we go. Yeah, so the, the question of whether the converse holds, whether you have this um, norming property of this in the dual space of epsilon x, like what this tells you, better write it out separately. So we have a map from the Radomacher space of x dual into the dual of the Radomacher space of x. So we have a map let's call it capital phi, like our other duality map for Bogner spaces. And it's, it's nice and injective. It's um, not necessarily surjective. And you can ask, okay, is, is this space, Radomacher space of X dual, is that norming for the Radomacher space of X? Can you recover? Is the, the Radomacher norm of a sequence equal to the supremum of all sequences in the Radomacher space of the dual of this pairing we have here. This is something we use all the time for Bochner spaces. We have this for Bochner spaces with no assumptions. This is what you would call K-convexity. This is one definition of the Barnack space property of K-convexity. I, I don't know what K stands for. No idea. It turns out this is equivalent to non-trivial type. Of X, actually. So even this norming property doesn't come for free, unfortunately. But the plus side is that it's actually very common for a Barnack space to have non trivial type. All of the spaces that don't have non trivial type are sort of pathological. They're like L1 or C0. In particular, all UMD spaces that we deal with will have non trivial type. Okay, that wasn't very clear. I mean, all UMD spaces have non-trivial type, not just the ones we deal with. UMD implies non-trivial type. <laughs> Go be careful. Right, that's all of my lecture notes handled. We can finish early or I can make one more comment. I guess I have the time, so I may as well make the one extra comment. Before my comment, are there any questions about Radomach spaces? Cool. Okay, my one little comment, which is going to lead on to the UMD property. If you consider a Radomacher sum, a Radomacher average in, in LP, say, this is a, this is a sum of differences of a martingale. If I write F dot, or oh, not F dot, if I write Fn to be like I was doing in the proof of Kahn Kinchin before, the sum up to N of the Radomacher sum, then F bullet F dot is a Martin girl. It's actually just a special case of the whole gambling structure we were talking about the whole time where you bet the vector xj at every step independently of what happens in the previous steps. And the difference sequence, dfn, well, dfn is just, it's the sum up to n minus the sum up to n minus one, right? So it's just the nth term. So the nth term of this Radomacher sum is a difference term of a Martin girl. So we can write this Radomacher average as the sum over N of different sequences. 
of elements of the different sequence of the Martin gel. Yeah. Now, if we take this, this different sequence, but we put coefficients out the front, and we take these ANs to be either plus or minus one, then okay, we know that this is just the the Radomacher sum with coefficients. Oops, that's not Fn, that's Xn. And because the ANs are signed, we have signs, we actually know by the argument that we used in proving the contraction principle, all we're doing is taking the Radomacher sequence and replacing it with an equally distributed Radomacher sequence, a different Radomacher sequence, but still a Radomacher sequence. So we can forget those coefficients. So just to fix my little square of equalities. Well, hang on, what am I doing? It doesn't go this far. This sum of martingale differences with coefficients is equal to the sum without coefficients. As long as all of those coefficients are between plus and minus one. In particular, if you take the supremum over all a n in plus minus one of this average or this LP norm of this sum of martingale differences, the supremum is well, equal to the LP norm without coefficients. In particular, it is bounded by that up to a constant. The constant's one and you have equality, but it is bounded by the right-hand side up to a constant. This property here, if I put less than or equal to up to a constant, this is the definition of the UMD property, except it has to hold for all martingales. So if this is true for all martingales f dot, this is the same as saying x is umd, or actually what we'll call umd sub p, because I'm taking an LP norm. Now for the particular case of this martingale, Radomacher sums or Radomacher partial sums, you have this for all Banach spaces and you have it for all p greater than or equal to one. But if you want this property for all martingales, it turns out to be a strong Barnack space property. Radomacher sums are not enough to give you something interesting here. They're just, they're too well behaved, right? It's a very particular martingale structure. You can do more general than that. Yeah, I just wanted to use Radomacher averages to give a bit of a foreshadowing to what the UMD property is. And there it is. We'll do that on Tuesday. I will have the notes done by Tuesday. <laughs> Unfortunately, you've run out of lecture notes at this point. I recommend doing the exercises and going back and looking at past material if you really need to read something. Okay, that's it. Any questions? No. Maybe just a comment. Like yep. Sort of thing you see where you use martingales to classify stuff. It comes up a lot in probability as well. Yeah. Um, funnily enough. <laughs> Maybe not so funny, but. Uh, it sort of makes sense, right? Except you don't have so many Barnack spaces showing up there. So you're using it to classify other properties, right? Like so -and -so, yeah. if so-and-so thing holds for a certain class of martingales and you have so-and-so other property, except you have all these continuous time things as well. So you have a much richer class of martingales to work with. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're just doing discrete time, sort of very simple martingales, but the complexity comes in looking at what Barnack space is valued in. Mm. Yeah. We're almost at the point where we can stop using martingales, actually. We've been doing, like this This course is supposed to be analysis in Barnack spaces. Like half of it is martingales in Barnack spaces, I realize. Maybe I should have called it that, analysis and probability in Barnack spaces. But I might've got even more students that way. Or I might've scared some people off. <laughs> That's probably more likely, yeah. I think Christoph's not here, he would have asked some very good questions if you were here. I don't have his level of insight, unfortunately, so I can't ask a, a Christoph question or a Christoph comment. 